Hello everyone, here we are with Dr. Stephen Threadgold from the University of Newcastle and Steve's reading is one that's been allocated for this week talking about figures of youth. So we're lucky to have him and he's going to explain to us a little bit about his paper, what made him write the paper and how he sees the paper being uh, applicable to ways we might see youth represented in the media and also beyond. So my first question, Steve, is what was it that made you write this paper? Okay, uh, yeah, thanks for asking me to do this, Megan. Um, basically, the, the ideas in the paper developed out of, um, you know, doing youth studies now for, you know, a PhD on it and then, you know, working in the field for about 10 years and doing lots of research and having a particular, I suppose, orientation towards young people, which I think in good youth studies is like, representing their point of view, writing about their experiences, their lives, their emotions, their materiality, all this kind of stuff. Um, I started to kind of suspect whether that was the case across youth studies. So there was that. Um, sometimes I think people doing your studies don't actually like young people. So I started to think about whether like what was going on here. But also, of course, um, a part of youth studies has been, you know, the study of representation of young people in the media. So you know, they eat too many avocados, therefore they can't buy a house. Um, they're, you know, lazy. They're apparently not loyal to their jobs, even though, you know, the job market is ridiculous. So um, politically, there's very different figures of youth is what I call them. And I, and I use the idea of figure here to think about the way that something like youth or young person can be used like really differently across a whole bunch of different platforms and media or even within academia between psych and sociology or within sociology between different theoretical points of view. And what it means is that when people are using that term, they can often be kind of almost talking past each other. They're talking about young people, but they're talking about them in really different ways. So um, I think, you know, one of the, you know, one of the, so in terms of the kind of motivations for it, there was like something like this, the um, pretty famous and how kind of idea that millennials just kill everything. Um, but like, you know, really capitalism kills all these things. Um, so it seems to me that the young people are often used as a figure to kind of blame for things that are going on in society, which, you know, they have a very little kind of blame for, but also there's like this kind of example of, you know, within capitalism, you know, in the figure of youth in capitalism, for instance, um, is, is kind of contradictory. On the one hand, they're seen as this kind of thing to blame for things going wrong. But on the other hand, you know, youth and young people's bodies in particular are used to sell us stuff all the time. Um, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, edgy stuff is cool. Um, we all want to remain young in some way because we don't want to die. So, you know, this, again, this idea of youth transforms itself across these different platforms and is used in really different ways. Mm. Mm, that's really interesting and I'm thinking about a lot of media reporting that's happening at the moment around young people and COVID-19 and the kind of, you know, this figure of the irresponsible young person who, you know, can't stay inside and needs to be social, yeah. needs to be out doing things, but also at the same time is framed as being, you know, lazy and never goes out, and never tries to do anything, doesn't have social connections, isn't a social citizen, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, that it, your paper made me think a lot about reporting on young people's experiences of COVID-19 and how they become scapegoated. Yeah, I think there's a really good example. I mean, yeah, you're seeing these in the paper every day. I think the World Health Organization made an announcement yesterday that young people are responsible for the pandemic, you know, not going down or whatever. And then you have the usual, yeah, that, I think that this, this story was, had a photo of, you know, a group of young people in Barcelona sitting on the steps. So all the pubs and clubs close and they're socialising sitting on the steps. And this was kind of representational of how they're spreading the disease, uh, spreading the virus. But, you know, they all had masks on for a start. They were 1.5 metres apart. Mm -hmm. Young people might be actually, in a way, disproportionately kind of seem to be having it at the moment. But, of course, they tend to take up the jobs that are in the front line of kind of essential work. They're the ones that are servicing people. They're the ones delivering your food. They're the ones making it. Um, mm -hmm. they're the, you know... There weren't a lot, heaps of young people are in things like care work and stuff like that that are actually kind of looking after people. And, and so, like, again, there's a distortion going on quite often when um, these kind of, particularly when quantitative things 
are represented by a kind of qualitative image or a qualitative um, representation of what's going on that often distorts the actual reality, I think, of the, of the blame or the relations or whatever. Mm, yeah, definitely. So I was thinking about um, when you were talking and you were saying that these kind of figures of cool and sexy and edgy and, you know, how young people kind of represent almost like an anti-adult um, like that, that quote that's like, youth is actually anti-adult. And I'm wondering mm. whether you feel that that is true. Is youth an anti, anti-adult? Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's a good point. I think my paper touches on this and I think um, Dave Farouge's work is also kind of touching on this. And um, um, Harry Bladder has written quite a lot on adulthood as well. And um, all, all this kind of conceptual work thinks about how this idea of youth um, is kind of broken away from that age bracket i suppose so we have that kind of official versions of it you know to get youth allowance or whatever that's called these days or whatever 15 to 25. Um, youth transitions work has shown that much of the stuff about being an adult that used to tick off you know like by the time you were say 25 of like getting a full-time job getting your own place to live getting a partner and settling down and having your own family certainly doesn't happen in that period anymore it's actually happening much later and for many people it's not, it's not happening at all so those markers of adulthood, I think, um, you know, am I a 40 year old child? Because I'm not married and don't have kids like, you know, but I have a mortgage and I have a long term partner, I have a full time job. So I haven't ticked off all those markers of adulthood yet. So what does that difference mean? So um, more culturally, though, like, yeah, it's definitely youth is something that is mined, I think, in, in popular culture, in advertising um, and, you know, I talk about this a little bit in the paper around temporality that um, youth represents the future um, in the sense that, you know, it's always like this cutting edge edgy stuff, you know, um, and, and you know, older people don't understand what younger people are doing because they're doing kind of the here and now, but youth also for, as you get older represents your past and you tend to look at it nostalgically, you know, my music is better than young people's music and, you know, you have an emotional connection to those things. So again, the term breaks away from that age category and becomes a conceptual device and it's an effective device. It makes us feel things. Um, and so particularly around that divide between youth and adulthood, I think it's increasingly meaningless to the point where we need to kind of almost get rid of it mm. um, because that kind of idea of youth being this liminal period between being a child and an adult doesn't seem to work anymore because people are kind of doing stuff now well into the thirties and forties that, would have been seen as kind of temporary in the past. That's got nothing to do with the fact that they're kind of less capable or less responsible. It's got to do with economics. It's got to do with like the impossibility really of getting full-time work for many people, the, the huge precariousness of the labor market. It also has to do with, you know, like, you know, like more and more women going into the workforce in some respects and having more choice, but then, you know, women having kind of that double bind of having to have the career and still do the bulk of the, the family stuff and the child rearing and all that kind of thing. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why mm. that stuff is happening later and later that makes that um, dichotomy between, well, the, the dichotomy, the, 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 the distinctions between child, youth and adult, I think increasingly blurry. Mm. And then we have, you know, the kind of individualization kind of theory, which says that if we um, do a bad job, in any of our decision making, for example, like I am a woman and I mean, I don't have children, but if I do a bad job of uh, having a full time career in a precarious labor market, that means yeah. somehow that I personally have made a bad decision and not done enough um, mm. to get myself, you know, to a position where I'm competitive within this particular labor market. And so we really internalize those risks that, yeah. that are actually structural. Yeah. Um, yeah and I think kind of your figures of youth paper really highlights that structural uh, phenomena and the structural inequalities are kind of foregone in a lot of media reporting yeah. because we imagine a young person just not doing enough. Yeah, yeah, this has been particularly um, a thing that youth studies I think has been great at um, uncovering and doing research and showing the kind of falsity of the individual blame game. I mean, I think I saw something again last week that there was like 1.3 million unemployed people at the moment looking for jobs and there was a hundred thousand jobs on seek. Like, but yes, if you, if you're on kind of, you know, traditional, um, uh, um, uh, what's it called? Um, whatever the doll's called these days, 
oh, you've yeah. got to apply for like yeah. you know six jobs a week or whatever it's just absurd the kind of the idea that you can you know um easily pick up a full-time job in that kind of labor market so the individualization thesis i think has been really important for considering that it means that like there's all these structural changes that have basically increased precarity and uncertainty um yet blame for not succeeding is solely placed on the individual for not making the right choices yet you can make all the right choices you can and it can even be relatively privileged and like get a good degree and then get out there and try and get a career and you're still going to find that you have to kind of do two years of an internship or something or all these kind of stuff to get into that field so um it's important to kind of consider both the general generality of that increased precarity but then also the way that inequalities play out within that kind of you know new atmosphere and certainly those traditional inequalities you know class race gender ethnicity sexuality all these things disproportionately mean that some people face more risks than others mm. yeah so the students in sociology of youth uh, for their first assessment are working on a media representations of youth so i thought your figures of youth paper would be a good way for them to start thinking about not only social generations and youth transitions but also how we create moral panics around young people, how we imagine young people, you know, to, to be kind of social citizens in the world or not social citizens in the yep. world. So I wondered if you had an example um, of how you've seen youth sort of represented in the media in a way that actually wasn't, you know, the way that <laughs> it's been discussed. Yeah, well, look, it's, it's every day, isn't it? Like, it's very, like, I, I, there's a few things going on now, I think. I think, firstly, like, media representations are never the truth or accurate. You know, it's, it's an impossibility in, for all kinds of reasons, let's face it. But, like, it's more, it's more so when there's obvious distortions that mean that there's winners and losers. Some people benefit more than others because of these distortions that are the problem. Um, so, you know, you can see, you can see, for instance, when young people are represented in terms of their political engagement. Most moral panics talk about how they're apathetic and vapid and don't care enough and all this kind of stuff. Um, and there's lots of work that shows that they just care about the same amount as, you know, the general population anyway. So that's, that's in itself a distortion. Um, there's a, there tends to be often moral panics or at least struggles over like young people that they do their politics wrong um, compared to my generation. And this happens not just in terms of electoral politics or joining parties or not, but you can see it in struggles over things like feminism and stuff like that throughout generations. But on the other hand, when it comes to politics, youth are seen as really dangerous. Um, they're seen as the ones that could cause revolution. They're the kind of apparently most naive or most kind of radical or whatever, and they need to be kind of taught to be more sensible and be more responsible, i.e. be more conservative. Um, and, you know, you can see protests, you know, and things like that. You know, young people are often, you know, the ones that are disproportionately there but protesting and rioting and stuff like that is the wrong kind of politics, right? It's, it's not in order. It's not just kind of choosing, you know, the same two sides of the same coin or whatever. So um, I think they're really good examples. That on one hand, young people are really vapid and lazy and apathetic and apolitical. But on the other hand, they're dangerous and radical and um, a threat to the kind of moral fabric of society or whatever. Mm. So I talk about that quite a, bit, a lot in the paper. Um, there's also, like, I think even within youth studies um and, and and as i said before it's kind of the genesis of the paper in some ways is that there's people that, that do research on and with young people that also have a kind of different figure of youth so on the one hand there's that that at risk figure you know that um things like social work and psych in particular are interested in helping and protecting but like peter kelly's work in particular shows that much of that work seems to be kind, kind of quite governmentalized it, um, wants to discipline young people into being a particular kind of citizen, you know, a productive citizen for capitalism, I suppose. Um, now, that's not to say that those fields and that work isn't important and doing really good work for young people, but it also has these other effects as well. Um, on the other hand, there's kind of the, the kind of um, cultural dupe um, analysis of young people where they, you know, they don't know what's good for themselves, they make their own choices, they, you know, too busy on Facebook or what, Twitter or you know, TikTok, I'm showing my age here, right? So um, again, and, and with, even within that work, sometimes there's quite a kind of distorted figure of young people that they can't make the right decisions. And if only they kind of read the right books or did the right courses or this kind of stuff, they'd be better and would think more like, you know, they need to think about the world. Um, 
I suppose the figure that I use in my work is a, a figure of struggle that young people are kind of, you know, born into the world. They are socialised in a certain way. They have to kind of are therefore socialised to make these decisions to, you know, get the right job, to find the right partner and that kind of thing. And, you know, they use the tools that they have to try and make those decisions and they make those decisions reasonably. You know, they can, may look like they're sometimes not making the right decision, I suppose, but like, Quite often within their own circumstance, you know, one person's wrong decision may actually be right for them. So um, even within something like youth studies, and there's many more, I think, there's kind of different ways that um, researchers figure the idea of a young person within their research. And I think it's inevitable and there's nothing actually wrong with it. And particularly if you're using different theories, you're going to have that all the time. But I think we need to be more... Um, or understanding of it ourselves and reflexive of it when we do it. So when we do talk to each other and when we're kind of talking about our research, we actually have a more clearer understanding of what we're talking about mm -hmm. rather than talking about this young person where we're sometimes talking past each other, I suppose, and not necessarily talking about the same thing or the same aspects of young people's lives or even the same attitudes towards what we think young people are. Mm -hmm. Does that yeah, make sense? Very interesting. <laughs> um, and you were talking earlier about uh, just to me before we were recording we were talking about the famous picture of all the young people at the uh the lawyer oh, yeah. Louvre um on their phones yeah um I think that's it yeah so i think you know here's a good example of those figures in capitalism thing like i mean on one side there you've got the typical figure of the young sexy person to sell your stuff mm -hmm. on the other side here you've got like the, you know the apparent vapid young person you know staring at social media when they're in this kind of very famous gallery. What are they doing? They should be looking at the art. And like this picture literally appeared in many moral panic stories. But the background of that story is those kids are on a school excursion and they're all looking at, you know, um, they're all reading about the art. They're actually doing research and they're learning there. Mm -hmm. So I think in that example, there's a, and the, not just the, 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 the comparison between those two images, but the distortion of what's happening in that image, the, the one where they're in the gallery is a good example of the, the um, scapegoating of young people constantly in, in the media and how we need to be really critically careful when we're kind of reading any stuff in the, on those platforms in terms of how they're presenting things and the reality of what's going on there, I suppose. Mm. Sorry, could you see that? Ben? I couldn't see the photo, no, but that's okay. I will put the photo up. Um, I'll in... probably just put it up. Yeah. So, I'll just put oh, this. here we go. Oh yes, of course. Oh yeah, so we've got the young people looking at what looks as to be yeah. Facebook. That's the assumption. Yeah, the one one side you've got the kind of you know look at them all you know looking at um, you know Instagram instead of looking at the art. Mm. Um, but you know, yeah, so I think um, you know those examples. I think you know are a kind of nice elegant way to kind of show what I'm talking about there, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Well, I feel like you've gone and gone over your paper quite you know extensively and I think the sociology of youth students will be really appreciative of having you here so I'd like to thank you for your time Thanks, no worries. and um, I will report back to you and let you know how we go in our <laughs> assessments and if anyone uses that very same photo. Cool okay and if they want to look at other work about figures too they should check out um, the stuff that I did about hipsters and bogan so I do, I do that work about figures of youth but I've also got some analysis that um, Thinks about class relations through figurative things as well and I use hipsters and bogans to kind of compare and contrast different kind of cultural and um, pop cultural aspects of media as well if that's kind of relevant another assessment on this one awesome I think we might talk about that in our week on class excellent okay <laughs> thanks, thanks Megan. bye